I prepare to read the Imperial Tarot, to connect with the element of the Emperor that is within us all, always vigilant in the ether, despite his corporeal form being stationary on the Golden Throne, unmoving and speaking for over 10,000 years. Still, he holds the vigil. Still, he is the lighthouse of our souls. Humanity, all of us, are under his aegis. Of course, I speak of the master of mankind, the Emperor. It is how we allow him to guide us, the drawing of cards, the interpretation thereof. He guides our hands, helps form our opinions, shows us the way, and through his tarot, we can see what was, what is, and what may yet come to be. But the last is usually so we may prevent it. For the tarot shows the stakes and import, what could happen, not what will happen. For this would remove all agency from us. The tarot only shows some of the future, a possible future. A future that we can change and do every day with our actions, our courage, our faith in humanity, if not in the divinity of he who shows us the way. It is not easy, for it requires we open ourselves to the warp, that we become attuned first. And of all the struggles of a space marine, a human, a psyche, a librarian, there will never be a greater struggle than that required to look into the warp, to harness it in any way. For to do so is to not only open oneself to all of the beauty and horror of the warp, not only to ignore and resist all of its many subtle liars and degenerate manipulators, it is also to confront oneself. One's deepest secrets, one's darkest fears, one's hidden desires. It is to stand bold and unarmored in the presence of all of these truths, and to not only control them, to rob power from them by accepting them, but to also destroy them through dint of will alone. For all of our days are defined, even more so than any of our battle brothers. They are defined by that one word, will. For we are weapons of too much power, of too much potential calamity, to ever fall to the blandishments of the dark powers. For one of us to fall is potentially worse than the entire company of our brothers in arms. The danger and damage wrought could eclipse all but the most gifted of psychers, and all in the housing of a near-immortal, near-unstoppable body, that of the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marine. So the conditioning we receive, the trials we face, the tests we undergo, they are even more severe than those of our brothers, hard as that is to conceive. For there has never been one such as the Astartes in all of the history of humanity, from the days of the Spartans to those terrible warriors of old terror, when the techno-barbarian tyrants unleashed the full force of the genome and all of its power across the face of the cradle of humanity. Even beyond them, there has never been a warrior such as the Marine. Pure martial power to the exclusion of all else. Altered on the genetic level, manipulated and cut and changed, forced through dehumanizing and desensitizing regimes of training that only one in a thousand can endure, if not less. The ultimate weapons, not required to do more than point in a direction to unleash them, in the knowledge that practically nothing in the galaxy can stay their advance, and nothing can truly stop them. Now imagine that twinned with the power to call down storms, lift entire tanks into the air and launch them, to control the very earth below them, and rent chasms at a whim. A combination, I believe, should never have happened in all good faith, but one that is required, fundamental to the survival of our battle brother Astartes, and through them, the entire Imperium of Man. For sometimes one must fight fire with fire, much power to power, and in this, we stand as the wielders of the fire, 
the bringers of this power to the battlefield and beyond. Where the taint of chaos is marked, where the lesions of hell are abroad, where the Xenos filth twist reality with their charms and glamours, where apparitions stalk across the veil, then is the time my kind are called. We are the librarians, the scholars and psychers of Adeptus Astartes. Where others use bolters, melters and grenades, we use our minds, our will and our power. We take the sword to those that would brush our brethren aside. We are warriors of the same cloth, the same stripe, but of a different magnitude, of a different arena. And we must always be stronger than any of our brothers to match these trials. For only the most controlled and loyal, most disciplined mind can work the war without it befouling them. But how we are different. So many aspirants die in the first weeks. This is true of all Space Marine hopefuls. Those who would sacrifice their lives, their future, their freedom to become the walking weapons of humanity. The Emperor's own angels of death. But even so, the rates of attrition in the hopefuls of the Librarius are even more tested, even more tried, even more likely to expire. This is as it should be, for the reasons I have given before. Because of the damage, the evil that could be done if one of us were to fall. So it is better if all in a cohort fail and die than one, even one weak link, be permitted into the unbreakable chain of the Librarius. There are but two ways one can be chosen, can become a Librarian. The first is more usual. The black ships of the Sisters of Osiris ply the voids of the Imperium forever in search of mutants, but the ones of most import, of the most power, psychers. Many do not survive the trip, the journey to their next locations. Of those that do, many are deemed too weak, in warp ability or in mentality or spirituality, to be able to progress, to be useful or even merely safe. They have another function. Again, for the best. Of those who are strong enough, some are taken from the herd. Those that are also physically able, potential candidates for the gene seed of the Astartes. They are trained in how to be safe by the Scholastica Psychana, barely. Then brought to the chapter to which they are an aspirant. Many are brought. Few, if any, pass the trials. They must be every bit as physically and mentally strong and deadly as their brother marines, you see. The other route is more rare, but always possible. I am living proof, you see. For the gene seed that is implanted in our bodies to make us into space marines is directly from the templates of the genes of a Primarch, and many of them were formidably endowed with psycho potential. Thus, amongst the space marines, there is the situation whereas a person with no prior ability develops it. <laughs> a throwback to the might of their sires. Thus it was for me. I had never been gifted with any ability until I was near halfway through my progression toward being a space marine. I was then scanned by the librarians upon being given the gene seed. It was that day that my life changed, for it was irrefutable that I now had the gift. Many call it a curse. Many days I have believed them, but they do not see what I have to see. Do not know of many of the things I have to be all too aware of, that they need never consider. I hear the whispers of our enemies, fear them defecating on the very walls of reality, can almost taste the corrupting powers as I encounter them, or hunt them. But I would not trade it for anything. For in many ways I am the most connected to the Emperor, for only we librarians can even begin to conceive of what it is he had to has to go through every second of every day. In this knowledge I feel blessed, and I am honoured. The struggle is worth it. The ability to be a greater tool of his justice, his will, his plan for humanity, is more than recompense for all that we endure above and beyond that of even our brothers. We are his librarians. We bring down the Emperor's own wrath on his enemies. So more should be expected of us. It is fair. But let us go back to today. 
I felt them break into reality less than a day ago. It began this morning. The Mandeville Point opened and something came out. Ships arrived from out of the warp. We all felt it as one. So attuned to the warp are we, the librarians of the Crimson Vigils chapter. A chapter founded specifically to hold vigil over this system in specific, for it is tainted and must be watched for exactly this sort of thing. This sort of evil. We approach the world at full speed, our battle barge thundering through the system already. We are always ready. The captain looks to me as we are prepared to embark. I know his one question. Do we have time? Once, we would be certain that our action time was more than safe, but not now. Not since the opening of the Great Rift. This is the third attempt on the planet in so many decades. Each time, they, the worshippers of the Dark Powers, the cultist or traitor scum that always attempt to do their gods' foul bidding, they have gotten closer to completion. By hours, or by even days. Now, despite how fast we reacted, we cannot be sure. So I check. I looked at my most important relic, that which is the entire reason for our chapter to exist, the Sword of Magalon. For on the sword are the runes, linked glyphs to those that contain that which is held on the fifth planet of the system, where a thing of evil is imprisoned, a barrier that can never be brought down, a cell that can never be allowed to be opened. I draw the sword and then push my will, my power, into its length. I mention the tendrils of my aura flowing down my arm and wrapping themselves around the hilt of the blade. Then, when I feel I have enough energy there, I push it up the hilt. The forced sword comes to life, crackling with power almost in parody of a power weapon. But it is not the same. It is not some ancient technology or field of negatively charged particles that sheath this weapon, but the unfettered energies of the warp. My power. As the power crashes down, the ancient artifact runes light up, but not nearly enough, and less than last time even. They have taken down more than half of the protective keys, the bindings. We cannot tarry, I say to my superior, the captain. He nods, and with a flourish of his hand, the loading of our men into drop pods proceeds apace. It was a choice between landing craft and pods, but we do not have the time for a perfect strategic landing and approach. We must go down their throats immediately. They must be stopped. We must be swift and utterly without mercy. I go down to the surface with the captain, in his pod. As we hurtle towards the planet, our ship's scanners confirm to all of us now in the pod that my instincts were correct. They have come in numbers hitherto unseen. Hence why they have already torn down so many of the glyphs and wards in such short order. Power breaks power, and they certainly have the numbers to generate the power required to make this easier for them. I make my knowledge clear to the captain, and our ship, the Emperor's Wrath, proceeds to lay down a spread of bombardment to cull the herd, to take away some of their advantage. I can only hope it is enough. We slam down as the fire ceases, so precise that they fired around our ships as we plummeted head first towards the site. The landing jets are jarring as they fire at the very last minute to slow us down before impact. We hit hard nonetheless. Charges on the doors explode, and in less than two seconds from impact we are out. The honor guard that accompanies the captain and I clear a zone around us. Pods are slammed down all around us as well, and the enemy is in utter disarray. They were packed so thick that some were actually burnt or crushed by the pods, but now they run. Many run away from us, many more toward us. Fanatical and unhinged eyes blaze in their skulls as they throw themselves at the bolters and heavy weapons, the flamers and melters that are sprinkled amongst the units around us. Chainswords screech their exultation to the skies as they go to work. Near a hundred marines and less than a score of pods are now tearing and shooting, blasting and barreling their way forward. On. We must push on. Whilst all of this happens around me, I concentrate on that which is my element, my part to play. I can feel the next board of the prison crumble without even needing to see the sword. I begin to hear the hissing and scratching of the things that are massing on the other side of the veil. 
those legions of evil that are salivating at the chance to break through. For just as the wards keep something in, so too do they keep things out. Like a shadow image superimposed on the real, I can see the things of the warp as if they are almost here, almost able to push through. They are all around us, beneath us, above us. If I fail to stop the ritual, we are all dead. With us, this entire system and then beyond. The captain sees my brief cut of a hand in our simple battlefield language and knows the time is now almost run out. He raises his sword aloft and all who see it then move towards us. He, the tip of a fighting wedge, now cutting into the enemy. The thousands around us mean nothing, for we can deal with them. My brothers can cull them all, given that one thing, time. I move up in the centre of the wedge, some paces behind the tip, as it ploughs into the centre of the enemy, toward the ancient and alien edifice in front of us. My brothers carve a path for me, and when we reach the stairs, we push up them to the very doors. We realise that there are no cultists now in front of us any longer, just the doors. The wedge breaks, and a corridor forms. My brothers to the left and to the right of me. I charge through this gap and through the doors. The hasty glyphs put up by those inside child's play for me to breach as I run. The clamour of the battle behind me. It is only I and two honour guard who enter, as the captain and our men hold back the teeming insane hordes outside. I use my sight. I can see their souls through the solidity of reality by glimpsing them in the warp. There are only three. They are in the central chamber, before the very bars of the jail, before the locks and glyphs that they are now attempting to force down. I lead, and do not even miss a beat when I cross a threshold to the room and engage them immediately. The two guards that followed me immediately fire at the three men who stand within a complex set of circles. Their bottom rounds slam into the shield and seem to do nothing, but as I have told them before, they keep firing. Each time a bolter hits that shield, those inside use more power to construct it or to hold it in place, thus giving them less to perform their ritual, or less to throw at us in whatever way their twisted minds will form the warp into. One of the cultists turns and attempts to slay my brothers by hurling lightning at them. I stand in the way and allow my psychic hood to do most of the heavy lifting in deconstructing the energies he has unleashed. I finish the job by absorbing the last of the blast before turning it back on the firer. I am a librarian, a psyker who is also a marine. My mind is iron, my will adamant, my ability to control and to harness the warp far beyond these cultist scum, gifted by the dark gods or no. My retort crashes into their shield and cracks it like an egg. Shards of force, invisible to my guards, smash and then explode inwards under the power of my assault. The force then collides with two of them and picks them up and launches them into the walls behind. I do not need enhanced senses to hear their skeletons shatter as they embed in the wall. Only one is left. He was chanting, was the leader, the master. He had his own personal shield. Now he is alone. No cultists, no acolytes, just him. And despite his wide grin, despite his darkened eyes shining at me, I can feel his fear. He raises his hands and moulds reality with lines of energy, forming a web before him that he then slams towards me with an outstretched push of his hands. He moves faster than I had anticipated. I can see he is the reason the runes have come down so swiftly. Yet despite his speed, despite his ability, I simply cut the lines of force as they come towards me with the same effort I would in putting my hand through a spider's cobweb. I untangle his energies and allow them to flow harmlessly past me. My guards are not so lucky. As the lines hit them, they cut straight through with the ease of a power sword through Grok's hide. My brothers fall to pieces behind me, literally. But there was nothing for it. No way I could save them and do what I now do. For the cultist, this witch, had to keep concentrating on the pattern for it to be used on them. And in that one moment, I strike. Unleash a bolt of such force that he cannot react in time. His last vision is the dead marines behind me sliding into segments on the ground. And me. My energies strike him and he is surrounded by them like a cocoon. His silhouette at the centre of the light. But not for long. For within three heartbeats, the shadow at the centre, his form, shrinks and shrinks, as the light I have created burns him away. 
until there is nothing left. I stride forwards and kick the candles over, break the many circles they had erected. The ritual is over, the last seals protected. As the massacre of the cultists proceeds outside, I begin to reinstate the protections again, as I have done twice before, and others of my order have done hundreds of times before. The captain does not even need to ask how things have gone. He knows, for he is still there. If I had failed, that would certainly not be the case. We have been victorious this day, but it will never be over. For chaos is a part of us, of humanity, so we'll never truly die. All we can do is hold the line, hold the vigil, every day, for all eternity. The smoke-filled air choked all with the courage of stupidity to venture outside. For the hive world burned, every city, every erection within it. Trails of smoke and flame rose to the skies, creating a shadowed twilight existence for all. The forces of chaos seemed unstoppable, their numbers almost infinite, their weaponry and material beyond any hope of resistance. The Priory Defense Forces had been swept away like so many wooden toys on a regicide board. And this was almost universally true. In only one place was their reign of tyranny and blood halted, resisted. Only one. But it was with a sinking feeling of utter desolation that the last free forces on the planet looked out from their walls and parapets. The enemy were amassing. And nothing, nothing, could stop them. Or so they thought. Three transports came hurtling out of the skies towards Cartagia Hive, the battered and partial shielding erected in a flash, the anti-aircraft emplacements whirling into life, like sunflowers turning their faces to the glorious dawn, each raised up and pointed towards the oncoming vehicles. At the very last instant, a communication came down from the trio of storm ravens, and a moment later, only in the very nick of time, did the guns cease their tracking. Close. But it was their way, to be in the nick of time, to only disclose the necessary, and only the minimum information required to boot. The three vessels tore down through the atmosphere so quickly that few would ever have noticed them, certainly none from a distance the smoke still billowing from the hive as it did. Coming down towards the central square before the palace of the governor, the vehicles did not even touch down properly. They hovered for a few seconds only, as a score and a half of heavily armoured space marines leapt out of open hatches down to the ground. And within heartbeats, the ravens were back in the air, heading upwards back to something in space, something in orbit. The Adeptus Astartes were here, the Emperor's own angels of death, and not just any marines, his mighty iron hands. The officer, a lieutenant by his markings, gesticulated and his men fanned out, heading for the most vulnerable positions in the walls, but most of them, it would seem, towards the gate. The governor, unprepared for such visitors, was some time in his arrival. Having drunk himself into a stupor and preparing to give his entire family the gift of the Emperor's peace, he was not roused easily, but he was roused. But by the time he was even semi-presentable, the Astartes had disappeared into the hive. With all of the speed that he could muster by lashing and screaming at his poor carriers, the Governor's palanquin made its way to the last known position of the Marines, the main gates. But there he found he was utterly ignored. Stepping out and barely supporting his huge girth on his underused legs, he stood watching as the marines took up their positions. Only one word resounded around his cavernous cranium. So few. His men now taking orders from the marines barked out quickly, and for the first time in his long and overstuffed life, he was superfluous to requirement. None even gave him a glance, their awe at the marines captivating them. 
or actually responding and obeying the huge warriors as they barked out commands to the pitiful forces that had been about to roll over and die. Not now. Even one marine made a difference. But now, there were over twenty. But they were not as usual marines, as far as any could tell. Not being versed or experienced in the Astartes, they were larger and bulkier than any that these people had seen in Pictor propaganda. The Gravis armored Astartes moved slowly for a marine, but deliberately, and a trap was about to be sprung. A wave of sound now hit the walls of the hive, the rumbling of huge vehicles making their way across the no-man's land betwixt the enemy lines and the battlements, and it was quickly followed by a barrage that made the shields light up like a sanguinala display. All was explosions, light, fire and doom, as areas of the shield fell under the onslaught, tearing huge buildings apart, burning ore that they touched with Prometheum. The devastation was horrific, but it was really all a distraction, to draw forces to firefighting and away from the main assault. What seemed like hours were merely minutes, and the next stage of the battle erupted with such clamour that the governor now wished he had never come, wished he had drunk his pre-prepared draught of instant painless relief. For there was no way in his mind, not even with the Emperor's own warriors present, that they could hold out against the forces of evil. He felt justified in his apprehension when the massive doors of the hive were smashed apart by the heavy fire of the enemy. Blown off their hinges, one dangling precariously before a myriad of other shells forced it back and into the square head overhead as it slammed into a cathedral at the front of the hive. The smoke and debris still falling all around him, clarity of vision not possible beyond the gate housing itself, when the first of the huge war engines barged through the gap and its tentacles grabbed the closest men and dashed them against walls, threw them in the air, the hideous monsters crashing and biting men in half as they appeared. But the initial shock was limited, and before he could understand what was happening, the monsters seemed to be melting before his very eyes. As he whipped around, he saw groups of three of these huge primaris warriors, eradicators someone had barked at one point he was sure. They simply walked forward. Under hails of fire, Lasgun, Bolter and Stubber tore towards the marines, and it seemed as if nothing could survive their ire. But onwards the Iron Hand marines strode. Stubber rounds pinging as they ricocheted off their gravis armor. Bolters hit, but left only dents. Las guns merely scratched their paint or made it bubble slightly. Nothing could stop them. And they appeared so calm. No shouting, no wild gesticulation, no running and no ducking. They simply marched onwards, grinding down their enemies, making all before them a mire of melted metal and bones. And this went on for an hour before it was simply impossible for the attacking force to come within fifty yards of the gap. So many of the monsters, armor and carriers of the traitors had been annihilated. And as one, suddenly, the firing ceased. The marines now stood, stock still, and looked up. The governor followed their eyes. They had merely been buying time, been holding out. As the governor now saw a huge metal whale like ship descending into low orbit, blotting out the sun. The governor was forced to his knees by the raising and falling of the ground itself. The shockwave that hit him and all anywhere near the gap, as the battle barge of the Iron Hands opened fire on the collected Chaos Army below. The barrage went on for only a few minutes, but when it ended, there was not a man woman or beast alive outside on the plains. And the governor could only utter one sentence to convey his awe and terror at what he had witnessed. The Emperor protects. Months. It had been months encamped in a circle around the city as we had been since the siege began, the rot to such an existence grinding us down far more effectively than any set-piece battle, any protracted engagement even. Sieges. Horrific affairs for both parties. Being on the outside looking in seemed the better option of the two, but it was not always the case. 
Sickness and hunger were rife in the camp. We had twice received rations from the wrong supply network, and the effects had been bowel liquefying for most of us. All humans may be the same, but the ecosystem that we had been raised on were different. The wrong rations could cause cramps, diarrhoea and worse. Twice this had happened, and it meant months of disruption as supplies were bought in bulk. Of course they were, but that consigned us to hell. The camp had gone to rack and ruin as the majority of the command staff were no more resistant to the effects than their men. No order, no discipline. We were more a shanty town outside the walls of the hive than a siege army. The commissars had tried to enforce as much discipline as possible, but few were on their feet at any one time. So it was executions across the board. Nobody had the time for a flogging. Certainly not that many. Then, in one day, it ended. All of it. It just ended. Grey painted Astartes, space marines, landing craft zoomed over our camp low one morning. They ploughed through the air, dodging and diving around the flak fire coming up to meet them. The Iron Hands. Holy throne. The Emperor had sent his angels of death. They ran in low and just dropped off their precious cargo in front of the very walls and zoomed off again. Those men inside, if I could even call them men, marched forward. They were like something from a sermon. Unreal, amazing, terrifying. They just walked forward, ever onwards, practically ignoring the fire coming down at them. Two lines were present, one in front, heads down and trudging. The second line were armed with heavy bolters, other bolters, that fired almost unfathomable deluges at the battlements, killing all who now dared put their heads over the parapet. The return fire went from a torrent to a trickle in less than a minute. They walked slowly in these battle suits that were even larger than their usual power armour. The front rank reached the walls, as we had done so many times before in the early days of the siege, <laughs> when we were zealous. But they didn't stop. There was a whining and whirring that seemed to echo around the entire valley as they simply walked through the walls. The front rank of the centurions had huge drills attached to their arms. Nothing stopped them as they dug their way through the walls. I watched and listened all day. The screaming and sounds of battle went on for hours. Hours. They just walked into the city, into the hive, and started to kill. And then they didn't stop. And finally, at dusk, the main gate simply opened to us. All of those who were able to walk, well, run, charge, but mostly lurch, made their way forward. We took the city. As out came those same marines. Not one inch of them was not covered in blood and viscera and dust and the signs of destruction and slaughter. They walked out and those landers simply returned, and on they marched, and off into the air they went. Less than thirty of them. Without a word to us, not one. They had ended it all. And for the first time in all of it, the entire siege, for the first time, I did not wish to be inside those walls, walking the streets of that city, that hive. I knew that what I would see would make me lose my lunch again. For I knew that they had killed everyone, levelled every Bastille, Hardpoint and Barracks, crushed any and all who stood against them. And on that day, I knew I would never defy the Emperor. Ever. Captain Rubrio Massaro of the Blood Angels had expected this moment earlier, but dreaded it. His field elevation had been due to the losses sustained on Baal. So many of his brothers had fallen that huge rents in the command structure were left where perfect order had previously been. He had spent time in the first company before, but he requested to return to the ranks, and his strange request was granted. But the cause for this rare and odd request had now gone. To the captaincy, 
he had been elevated. And now, it was time to literally prove he could walk the walk. The walk of the unrelenting. The step of destiny. The pace of war. He stood next to four other brothers, all veterans of the first company. His honor guard. His first. All awaiting Captain Rubrio's final trial by fire, before being fully accepted as one of the lords of the chapter. All stood awaiting the signal to jump. All stood encased in fully enclosed tactical dreadnought armor. Terminator Warplate. The heaviest armor at the disposal of the Imperium. Some sets present were ancient beyond belief, hearkening back to the days of the Crusade, when the Emperor and his sons, the Primarchs, bestrode the battlefields of the galaxy. The light finally turned red, and they took one step in unison onto the teleportarum plates and initiated the jump. Through the warp they travelled for mere seconds before reappearing in real space on the planet below. Without even a second of delay, the veteran honor guard unleashed their weapons into the nearest enemies. Xenos died in their droves as Captain Rubrio gained his bearings. As missiles, projectiles and grenades flew at these five men, they stood unmovable and invulnerable. All of it bounced clean off their dense armor, far heavier than even standard marine power armor. Rubrio looked at his more complex displays and then, finally, only three seconds from their appearance, signaled the direction of their target. As the honor guard used their storm bolters and an auto cannon to tear a bloody path through the clustered Xenos, they began their trudge. Nothing could harm them. Nothing could stay their path or hand, for the Emperor was with them. Sitting in the mess, I am alone. But I am a warrior, a soldier. We know there are three things more important than any other. Knowing when to stay quiet. Knowing when to sleep. And knowing when to eat. Never miss an opportunity. So I take my last one before it all begins. I enjoy the hearty platter of food in silence empty chairs at my table. That is only from the outside. What others can see. But unlike some, I do not mope. As I eat, I am surrounded by my pack. We eat in silence. But they are there. While I still have a brain to think, a soul to remember, my brothers will always be with me. I do not begrudge the young packs their exuberance, their fire, their passion, their joy. Even the primaris who tower over me, even they. They drink and eat and are bragging about how many they will slay this way, how tirelessly will be their arms that way. Heh, <laughs> good. Their elan is high, as it should be. We have been tracking a rock for days now slowly catching it. I despise the Greenskins, as I have seen what they do to the people of the worlds they land. But the young pups love to engage them. No hiding, no skulking, no chasing. They come to us. They throw themselves at us in their droves. It is messy business, but it is somehow clean, and it is exhilarating. It is what we were born to do. What we were built to do. To fight the enemies of the Imperium. Of humanity. Of the All-Father. So the young bucks brag and bluster as they should. They have much to prove. But they are still Volkaferica. They are sons of the Rus. They are death incarnate. They have earned their rights will earn more in the coming hours, as none of these are idle boasts. They are like oaths of moment that will be done. Good. They will need all the energy they can muster for this campaign. 
this battle. The packs of Primaris jump up and cheer as they slap each other on the backs and charge to their positions. I allow them all their head and finish my meal. Moments later, the last of my repast is gone. I stand and walk through the empty mess and in the direction of the bridge. The doors open to the usual vista and I see many a grizzled warrior and young buck behind a screen. All lights and darkness our bridge is functional. The lights are a dim red to key the mind and make the displays clearer, which now glare by comparison, centering the officers on their tasks. The captain turns as I enter the bridge. Harald, finally you are here. We close on our prey. This is one rock full of orcs that will not be destroying another of our worlds. We need to end it and every green skin on board. The packs look forward to the trial. Good, says the captain. They will need to be enthusiastic. This is a big one. It will be more a test of endurance than skill, I'd wager. Pfft, I respond. They will find the will. Heh. <laughs> a young officer looks up from his screen. Far from the rock! As soon as it is finished, the captain barks back. Damage report. Minimal. Scattershot across all decks, but armor and void shields are holding. It seems they only fired half their complements, sir. They don't want us dead, it seems. I walk to a junior officer and look over his shoulder at the Auspex arrays. There are orcs already outside on the hull of their vessel, brandishing weapons excitedly. I can see a few try to launch themselves at our ship kicking off from their vessel in an attempt to get to us before the rest, only to float away in space. They forget we are moving through the void at quite a pace. About a score of them will be floating there in the cold and dark until they die, thousands of miles behind us. We are in optimal range now, sir. Fire bombardment cannons. Full spread of heavy magma warheads across the enemy's decks. I watch as our heavy weapons respond, hitting their ship, but instead of punching inside and detonating like standard armament of the ships of the line, our magma warheads explode on the surface and a roiling wave of magma washes over their entire hull, burning thousands of orcs and destroying their sensor and targeting arrays. If they have any, it is orcs after all. Damage report. Minimal, Captain. 2% structural damage tops. Keep firing, haul guns. Let's not make it easy for them. Harald, time to get over there and start the day's work. Prepare the assault. I nod and make my way to the embarkation deck. The flurry of activity is heartening. Even the menials seem enthusiastic today as they move with rare verve and alacrity but weeks of relative inactivity in transit can hone the edge instead of dulling it, if they are drilled well. And from what I see, they were drilled expertly. All is nearing readiness. I only have to give the specific words. We can see and hear the effect of our fire on the rock, the orc vessel, through our own shields. It burns in many places now, but not enough. The Greenskins will still be teeming when we arrive. I bark out the assignments to the six squads we are sending in the first wave in boarding pods. The rest are to board via dropships and land on the rock when the first wave has secured the areas. Terminators are standing by for the decapitating strike on their CNC when we actually find it. Rocks are never uniform and always messy. It may take us days to clear one this big. But, as stated, 
At least it will be a straight fight. No skulking, traps or subterfuge. I board my dropship. I am ready. Time to purge some Xenoth. Filth. <laughs> this is the way it should be. My brothers, my pack around me. We are hurtling through the atmosphere at speeds I cannot even guess. We look at one another and grin beneath our helms as we descend towards a planet. Spat out of our orbiting battle barge like the breath of the wolf himself. We are his teeth. And we will sink them into the exposed underside of this enemy in his name. For the Great Wolf. For the Ras. The others call it a decapitating strike. Me? I call it Tuesday. The enemy awaits us. We should not leave them too long. The enemy has built fortifications, hard points, bunkers and barracks are plenty. They think they are invulnerable, untouchable. <laughs> they have never faced the Volgifinica. We will arrive in the courtyard of their highest mount, their deepest sanctum. We are laughing as their defenses try to spot us from the air. Pathetic. As we reach the last seconds, the thrusters fire. We decelerate, but still hit the ground hard. A normal human would have their bones shattered, their sinew liquefied by the force of it. I let my armor take the majority and enjoy the snap of pain that heralds our full impact. It jars my senses, wakes me up even more. I can feel the howl echoing in my every sinew, feel it coursing through my veins. The doors blow open. A mere second after our impact, and the turret fires out to clear away the closest of any scum who may have survived our advent. I burst from my fetters and join my pack in our ordered swift exit. We are amongst the sheep. My chainsword in hand, my pack around me. We dash toward them to start a blood tithe. Within the hour, this Bastille will be ours. The insurgents over before it began. Well, they say that the Astartes, the Marine, is a thing of iron will. They don't know the meaning of the word. I am a princeps of the Collegia Titanica, and I can tell you a thing or two about will. Try staring down a mountain, and the mountain flinches and moves to avoid your gaze. Then, and only then, do you know what it is to be a princeps? Every day I wrestle with a being that has existed from before the time the Primarch strode the stars. A lot longer. He has had a thousand pilots, a thousand princeps. He has learned from them all and is a mighty combatant. His machine spirit is strong. Stronger than most he stands amongst. Ostium Peniches in High Gothic. In low, he is roughly enemy's bane, and I consider it the crowning glory of my life to serve with him, to ride him into battle, to work with him to destroy the enemies of the Imperium. Before I came, he had not been mastered in a hundred years. His machine spirit was so strong. The second I heard of him, the second I met his gaze, I knew. I stood and looked at this towering god machine, all fourteen meters of it and more. It could be only he that was worthy of me, and I that was worthy of him. And we have brought annihilation down on the enemies of mankind from that moment onwards. Oh, how he struggled, 
how he rebelled, gaining his respect, gaining his compliance, proving myself to him. It was the most epic struggle of my life. Compared to this, no battle has ever been the match. But bend him to my will, I did. Now we are one. As the connections are attached by a gaggle of tech priests in their red robes, I am instantly aware of the whirlwind that is my titan. As I bid my friend good morning, he shows he is feeling frisky today. More to put it, he is feeling hot for the fight. He has witnessed two of his brothers die before his eyes. We watch together. We feel the white-hot rage together. Today, we bring this Azenos scum to heal. Today, we exact our revenge. He lets me know he is angry by resisting my first commands. But it is only a signal. I stared at the mountain, and it has flinched. Soon, he moves as I wish, but he has let me know. I am in accord with Ostium Perniches. I never shorten his name. I never abbreviate. It is beneath both of us. Before I was even permitted to enter this control center on that very first day we met, the guards checking my credentials even this deep inside him, I made that promise. Respect. I took the formal oath. This machine is discharged into your care. Fight with this machine and guard it from the shame of defeat. Serve this machine, as you would have fight it for you. While I mouth the standard response, I shall. I swore another oath. I would not be his last princeps. I would bend him to my will. We would bring fire down on any who threatened the Imperium. But the oath I swore was that I would die before Ostium Perniches. He would come out of my tenure as his pilot with glory but he would come out of it intact. He would sustain damage, of course, but I would not be responsible for the destruction and the death of a holy god machine that had served longer than my family had carried its present name. This I swore. But Hostium Perniches cares not for survival. He's a thing of rage and retribution. His hackles are up, and he needs to be let loose. So today... I shall give him his head, and we shall take this Eldar that has hunted our colleagues, Ostium Perniches, brothers and mine, and destroy it. The twisted Xenos have dared to emulate the god machines of the Imperium. Impertinent Eldar scum. Their time is over. They should know when to die. Today we will teach them this lesson. As the sun rises, we march from the base and take our place behind the lines. I have two moderati subordinates that assist me, but I care not to discuss them. They are necessary, nothing more. They are merely my aides, taking the slack of managing the mundane activities. It is I and Ostium Perniches who will fight this day, fight this battle. We wait for the first sign of our quarry. We do not wait long. Information is laid to us and the Xenos has fallen into my well-wrought trap. Ostium Perniches is fractious and despises to wait. The whirlwind that is my friend rebels and we wrestle again. It is exhausting, but I master him for his own good. And we wait. Our opposite number does what it has done for weeks now, arrives with the first light and proceeds to exact a horrifying toll from the forces arrayed before it, my colleagues, the forces of Im the Imperium. Today, I have arranged with the General of the Militarum to have his columns advance toward it, knowing my foe from hard time studying the Picts. We watch. It dances across the fire lines, moving at speeds and with agility that are simply impossible for Ostium Perniches and I. More the better. Arrogance. We let it go into its dance. I hear the complaints of the general as he bleats about the losses and demands our intervention. I ignore him. His tanks and men are like an ocean, easily replaced. We wait for the appropriate time but move up cautiously, stalking our prey. 
the elder moves to higher ground and fires down on the tank column. He is too fast for them to even dream of targeting with their clumsy guns. I order the artillery to fire as arranged. The huge elder thing then reacts by running along the edge of the hills, easily evading the box barrages. I almost feel I can hear it laughing. As it reaches the middle of the valley, we enact our plan. Marcin Paniches and I make ourselves known. It runs with the speed and grace of an unbaggaged athlete, so perversely graceful. Ha! We are ready. We stride forward with as much clumsiness as is possible. We are so slow, so cumbersome, but the Xenos filth knows it will need to get closer for its feeble weaponry to pierce our void shields. It begins to fire on us, to blind us, to antagonize us. We fire back and miss, of course, in our rage. But our plasma arcs too high and lands too low. It lands in the valley floor, hundreds of meters before the ridge. Look, Xenos, we are incompetent. The shields light up under its barrage of oh-so-accurate fire. It is literally charging along the ridge. We would be outflanked and destroyed, like the two god machines that had taken the field before. Not today. As the thing rushes along, I order the charges that we placed to be detonated. The ridge explodes, along a hundred meters or more. The Eldar thing loses its footing as I planned, and rolls down to the valley floor. Even that it makes look graceful somehow, but it is too late. It lands in the pools of plasma fire that we set up, and it slips and slides, like a grox on ice. And in that second, that moment of weakness, of vulnerability, where all of its speed and grace mean nothing, I let Ostium Perniches his head. He takes his revenge for the death of his brothers. We travelled by hauler, clandestinely, until we had reached the planet. No markings, no threat. When in high orbit, we scanned the planet for advanced war specs. None was in place, yet. Some of the ships coming to and from the spaceport were not a design of the Imperium. These filthy traitors will pay. As the old adage goes, Never trust a Xenos bearing gifts. This is how Xenos laid the trap. They make wild promises of a better life and pay up in trinkets and tech and anything else they think will get their foot in the door. When that has happened, it is a swift descent into their clutches. Xenos. Never ever trust anything they promise, provide or proffer. They want us all dead. But some are cunning enough to wait generations to attain their goal. Never trust a Xenos. Under any circumstances, gifts or no. So we went into high orbit and then down towards the land-based spaceport. On the way, our platoon was dropped. It was timed perfectly, as the ship travelled very nearly over our target. The doors opened on the side of the hauler, and out we jumped. A grav shoot slowing our descent, covered by the cowl of night. We are tasked with not using our thrusters, in case we are spotted. This will be a hard drop, but compared to even a normal day at the Scola Progenium, this will be a cakewalk. I see my platoon around me at regular intervals. We slowly descend, no sudden movements to catch the eye. Our weapons are blacked or stowed. To limit the chance of reflected light. But we need not have been so careful. As we descend towards what looks like an antiquated feral world castle, the lights from below are beaming and the halls loud enough to cover us, even if we had raised our voices collectively to extol the Emperor. One after another us drop onto the battlements and crenellations of this ancient building, all that they were capable of building before the coming of the Imperium to set them free. 
and bring them into compliance, and by doing so raise them up. Ingrates. How swiftly they forget their debts. Our briefing was simplicity itself. Tithes had not been paid for decades, and observers had been sent. It seems that the local aristocracy who ran this world had become bored of compliance, had started to make trade pacts with Xenos. So here we are. I can only hope that this message will be enough for this world. If this does not work, then they are sending Krieg. They won't like that. So ours is a last-ditch attempt to bring them back into the flock, into loyalty. I see a lone guard in front of me on the battlements, walking his rounds as always. He has not heard me. He is looking down into the courtyard where some fop is staggering around while throwing up a week's worth of rations for most. Probably a year's worth of any form of alcohol ration as well. I land daintily, quietly, and take ten quiet steps to be behind him. I put my hand over his mouth and with the other hand slip a knife into his back in just the right place. He struggles for less than two seconds before he is slack in my arms. I slowly crouch, placing him on the ground, as I see a score of my colleagues do the same from around other areas of the battlements and rooftops. We move as one. We are well trained. Everyone knows their role and performs it to the letter. Within a minute, there are our watchdogs on the walls, preparing to cause carnage when we do what we have been sent to do. For my part, I am standing on a high platform with a dozen of my fellows and we look down on the great hall. I have to refrain from hawking and spitting as I see what is transpiring below. Xenos, being feasted, being fated, being lavishly fawned over. One entire side of this 50 setting table is filled with blue aliens without any nose. Their expressions are blank, but their words seem warm. And the traitors on the other side of the table, lords, ladies, merchants and morons, are all lapping it up. Clapping and cheering at points as the leader of the blue monstrosities raises toasts, pretends to be human. My gorge rises, but I do not have long to wait. Our sergeant gives us all the signal, a silent thumbs up, and we act in concert. A dozen grenades are dropped over the side. The impact and the crescendo of the explosion slams into us all as we stand far away from the edge, but our helmets protect us from being deafened. In one smooth and fluid motion, we all then advance one step and level our hotshot las guns over the side and fire. We fire at anything that is still moving. There was not much. The entire aristocracy of this world has just been removed. The trade delegation of the Xenoth filth will not know it was us and potentially suspect a betrayal from the leadership of this errant planet. They will not react well. So with one strike, one action, just one platoon, we have pushed this world back into compliance. They will simply have no choice now but to stand and fight their erstwhile allies. Special Weapons Operative Jones 219 and Jones 324 were in trouble. They knew it. The enemy knew it. All day long, their emplacement had been the target of the main push. This had meant that they were the main target of the bombardment from the enemy. Hours of shelling, death falling amongst them without warning or without respite. In the moments before the assaults, the guns would fall silent. All ears still rung from the impact, and it would take a good few minutes before they even noticed that the barrage had ended. But when they did understand, all then got up from their huddled positions and raised their guns over the edge of the emplacement, ready for the headlong charging masses to appear. Thrice had this happened already this day. Hours of shelling punctuated by minutes of frantic firing, hoping to keep the ravening hordes of the traitor scum back. A long war on an almost barren world. It had bemused all that the Imperium would shed so many lives, so many resources, for what seemed a useless rock. But fight they did. For they did not know the resources in the ground, the strategic import of the world that their masters in the command tents were all too aware of. 
Jones 219 had been designated shooter, Jones 324 loader and support. A good thing, because 219 was clumsy with canisters, yet had the eyes of a hawk, and 324 was careful, but too reserved and considered to be aggressive enough to make the best use of the weapon in their team. A plasma gun. A good one. An old relic that had seen more battles than their entire regiment put together. But today, Beth, as they called her, was working overtime. The enemies who attacked did so with all of the resources they had garnered in their uprising, and makeshift tanks and APCs had been cobbled together or converted from old mining equipment and vehicles. But despite their ramshackle makeup, they were still lethal. As their brothers in the line shot their las guns at the hordes of mad cultists who charged them, Jones and Jones took aim on the larger targets, and they had reaped a great toll from the enemy this day. Two APCs, five bikes, two of their tank things, and more than a hundred individual cultists, for though the weapon was designed for the larger things, it worked just as well on the small. And thus a Jones and Jones shone today. But the last wave of weirdos to attack the lines was not the same. There were things that with multiple arms that slunk through the hordes, leapt from them when they reached the emplacement, and were terrors to defeat when amongst them. Just three had managed to get in amongst the lower lines thus far, but they had taken scores of men with them. So it was that Jones and Jones now targeted them. 219 was desperate to take some of them out, his blood pumping in his ears, his heart the only thing he could hear. So as he desperately shot, the things would leap to the side. One taunted him, its multiple arms swaying in the wind as it stood atop a burnt-out vehicle. But when shot at, it bounded backwards, not forwards, always in view of Jones and Jones. 219 shot again and again, barely missing the thing and getting closer with each shot. But he was so frantic that he could not hear the desperate pleas of Jones 324 to slow down, to take stock, to let his weapon cool. He did not hear the rising buzz from it, the high-pitched squeal it gave off. Thus it was that when Jones 219 had the being in his sights, had it banged to right, he pressed the trigger with furious abandon, desperate to kill this horror. And it was then that the ancient weapon did what plasma weapons always do when overheated. The second message was of more use. It was simple. Well, as simple as any message that has been through the warp. But what did we understand? Danger is coming, but help is on the way. We'd heard of strikes all over the region, while the Navy was embroiled in operations up and down the area. Hard fighting. We knew. We saw what state they came back in, as we were a relay and repair station, a staging ground for the fleet. So much combat recently. Not a day passed without new ships arriving or leaving. It was when we finally refitted and resupplied Battle Group Ashen Strike, and they had finally left the system, that the enemy struck. Sleek and nimble Xenos vessels, they seemed to come out of nowhere. They struck hard, crippling our sensors and defenses in successive over or under the station. Capital ships docked to us were also hit. The Emperor's ire, an old but much needed cruiser, was mauled. Its escorts were all but gutted, pinpoint fire coming from the Xenos ships with unerring accuracy. We were now sitting ducks. It was then that our choir informed us that help had arrived. Long Range Orgas detected but five ships coming out from the jump node. Only five. Our scanners could not discern their models then, but the moment of elation that the crew had felt at the arrival of support soon dwindled. The Xenos were too many, too fast. Five ships would not help. An element of the Xenos flotilla cut off and began to speed towards our rescuers, but when they got closer, they immediately broke off and ran as fast as they could back to the main body of the fleet. We were utterly bemused until the augurs began to cogitate, now that they were getting closer. A wave of attack craft came from the main vessel, and then, of course, we knew. It could only be an Emperor-class battleship. The other four ships its meagre escorts. It didn't really need them. The Xenos Admiral sent attack craft to meet those launched by our navy, but they were outnumbered, and our escorts cut those that got past our pilots into ribbons. The group just ploughed onwards, the main vessel accepting Xenos fire onto its massive void shield arrays. 
nothing penetrated. It hit its own range and fire erupted from the battleship. Many Xenos vessels evaded its cannon, but some did not. Any ship hit was torn to pieces or melted to scrap in seconds. And just as swiftly as it began, it seemed to be over. The Xenos turned tail and fled, disappearing into their hidden warp node. Indeed, this day, through the ages of his namesake, the Emperor protects.